Linda Golar Blunt is the president and chief executive officer of the Black Women's Health Imperative, which she has led since 2014. She previously served as a vice president of programmatic impact for the United Way of Greater Atlanta, and before that as, as first national vice president of health disparities at the American Cancer Society. She has her undergrad from Eastern Michigan University and a master of public health in epidemiology from the University of Michigan. And I've asked her to come talk about rare diseases in the context of diversity and clinical trial diversity and what needs to be done to make sure that rare diseases are be, being studied across a broad enough platform of patients to benefit everybody. So it's one o'clock right now, Eastern US. And we have her for 45 minutes and I will turn it over to Linda. She'll present and we'll have time for Q&A. Great, thank you. So hopefully you all can see my screen. Yes, we can, it looks good. Great, so thank you. It's, it's great to be here to have this conversation about rare disease and particularly as, as Chris mentioned, diversity in, in rare disease. And what I wanna do is spend this time talking about a rare disease diversity coalition that the Black Women's Health Imperative um, put together, give you an overview of what we're focused on, sort of why we decided to form this coalition, what the work has been about, and um, just sort of offer some, some thoughts on coalition building. Um, so to start, a little bit about my organization. Um, as Chris mentioned, we are the only national organization, national nonprofit focused on Black women's health and have been for some 38 years. Um, Billy Avery, who is our founder, was a community organizer and activist and brought 2,000 of her closest friends together to talk about how Black women should not only take care of each other, but take care of themselves. So we, we very much grew out of a self-care movement and for years um, held sister circles and other kinds of gatherings to promote self-care. And then over time, got into policy as we looked at the barriers that Black women were facing, uh, uh, getting access to quality treatment, preventive services, their ability even to practice self-care led us into the policy realm. And when I came on board about almost eight years ago, I brought with me a focus on research because while there are things that Black women absolutely have to do, um, there, are, there are things policymakers need to do but we need much more research um, across the board when it comes to Black women's health to fully understand what all of this means. And a little bit about our vision and mission. You know, our vision is simple, that Black women can enjoy optimal health in a, a socially just society. So one without bias, without racism, without gender discrimination, one that is organized to make access to healthy behaviors and services easy. And so what we do at the Black Women's Health Imperative is try to solve those pressing issues. Um, we've, in the last eight years, invested over $25 million in community-based organizations and policy initiatives and now research to make sure that women have access, that policies do promote our health, and that researchers, clinicians, and the everyday woman understand the benefit to inclusion in clinical trials and clinical research. So as a part of that, we formed um, the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. And you know it came about um, really out of a, a sense of fr frustration that, that I'll talk about in, in just a minute. Um, but first, you know, why was it even necessary? I mean, probably most of you on this call know that Black Americans and people of color have disproportionate rates of mor morbidity and mortality across a number of diseases. For Black Americans, that's 12 out of the 15 leading causes of death where Black Americans have higher death rates and almost all rare diseases when you look at them by race and ethnicity. Um, same is true for Black Americans and, and the indigenous population have higher age-specific death rates from cradle to grave. Um, it is true for Hispanics for certain conditions. And when we look at, at um, who gets sick and who's more likely to get sick, of course, it's people of color and low income people. I want to make sure that I am looking at this comprehensively for you all. So it's, it is people of color and people um, who have low income. 
And we've seen plenty of examples of where not having money has led to um, premature mortality. And just in the last year, of course, we saw that again and again with COVID-19. So again, why is this necessary? Because there is no biologic or genetic determinant for race. Um, in language that public health officials use and medical professionals use, we talk about health and data and race in a way that really misleads the listener or the viewer. We, we sometimes inadvertently lead people to believe it's because they're Black. We talk about Black women having 42% higher breast cancer mortality rates, but we don't put that in the full context. And so people often get the impression, oh, well, it's because they're Black. Or if we talk about you know, hypertension or you know, any number of other kinds of diseases. And that is, that is not true. It is not because they're Black, it is because of the experience of being Black in this society, in this time, and, and over history, frankly. And, you know, sort of another um, sort of point to, to mention is in this language, we talk a lot about diversity, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also tend to use in the field the term minority. Minority is a math term. So in the U.S., depending on what state you're in, who's the minority? So I'm, I'm cautioning the, the folks that I talk to to be careful when using a math term and applying it to an individual because it has become a pejorative over time. If you're in California and you're white, you are in the minority, but that's not how we tend to use the term. And the same is true for the, the term diversity. We tend to re refer to people as diverse. You know, there can be diversity within a group, but a person can't be diverse. And what that does is it sets up a power dynamic. If I'm diverse, why aren't you diverse? And so there's really a sea change happening around language so that we actually say what we mean and mean what we say. So again, why is this necessary? Just a little bit of history. Um, going back 30 years, um, we have been talking about the effect of racism and gender discrimination on health. Arlene Geronimus talked about this in 1992 when she coined the term weathering. Literally, black women are aging faster than white women because of the epigenetic expression of stress, you know, hundreds of years of, of racial and gender oppression. Uh, Tanae Lewis at Emory found that telomeres at the end of, the, uh, of our DNA were literally fraying, the cell life was shorter, leading to inflammation and metabolic changes. And she was able to draw a causal relationship between those changes and experiences of racial discrimination. And Fleeta Mass Jackson in a film that I encourage you all to see, it's, it's old now, but it's called um, Unequal Causes, is, is un Unnatural Causes is Inequality Making Us Sick. Fleeta Mass Jackson talked about maternal mortality being related to um, racism and gender discrimination. And then there's the historical abuse and mistreatment. I mean, we've been talking a lot about that with COVID-19 vaccines. And there is justification. J. Marion Sims, once considered the father of gynecology, brutalized slave women, uh, women who were enslaved. Henrietta Lacks um, had cervical cancer and her HeLa cell line led to many therapeutic discoveries, but she was not consulted for, on that and nor was she given credit until fairly recently. And of course there's the Tuskegee experiment and you know, when, when talking about sort of vaccine hesitancy, which is in the news now, when we, you know, people remember that even people who weren't alive, you know, 50 years ago with Tuskegee, it's still in kind of the zeitgeist. They still remember this, and this leads to mistrust of the medical system, mistrust of research. So we've got some some real barriers to overcome. But I just want to caution that all of this is not history of a long time ago. Just literally four years ago in Georgia, where I live, there was the forced sterilization of Latinas in uh, Georgia psychiatric institutions. So there is still cause for medical mistrust, even today. And of course, there's you know, persistent health disparities um, and disparities in health outcomes that we all are familiar with. Um, we saw it with COVID-19, dexamethasone wasn't as effective 
in the black population while there were no black people in those clinical trials. The pulse oximeters did not work as well on people with dark skin. Again, who was in the clinical trials? And when we think about something like um, genetic testing for breast cancer, you know, most black women are not tested. Those who do get tested, test because get that test recommended because they've they've said I have a family history. But the physicians don't tend to ask them, and so they don't tend to recommend genetic testing. So when it when we think about clinical trials, the number one reason that black and brown people don't participate is really because they're not asked. Um, providers simply don't ask because they make assumptions about what their patients will and will not do. Take you know takes you have to get time off from work, childcare, transportation. So providers make assumptions that their patients of color just won't participate. Um, and frankly, the informed consent process is quite burdensome. It is designed to protect the research institution and, and frankly, not the patient. But because of these assumptions, many people of color are never offered the, the opportunity to, to participate. And those who do want to still face barriers. Where, where are these trials located? Do they have to travel? Do they, in fact, have to take time off from work? So we like to say clinical trials may not cost anything, but they're certainly not free. And then there's the, the evidence base. Um, you know, there's a, a, a famous quote that what becomes evidence depends on who's asking the questions, who they're asking, who they're collecting data from, and who's funding the research. Well, we know black women are 12 to 40% less likely to get genetic testing, Patients on Medicaid or other public insurance um, programs are almost never offered genetic testing. And so, you know, what happens are delays. You know, I've lived in the Caribbean for uh, a few years, and there was a saying, it's not who you know, but who knows you. People often find that they have to know, that somebody has to know them and advocate for them to get the kind of care that they need. When we look at delays in diagnosis, the, the average person of color will wait five to eight years before getting to a diagnosis, let alone treatment. We have a, a participant in one of our programs who has kidney disease. It took 10 years of repeated physician visits, symptoms, you know, all kinds of, of presentation of, of, of complaints. And what he got from his providers was, oh, you should not eat fried foods. Oh, you should not use drugs. This particular patient happened to be a vegan and an athlete, did not use, he did not abuse substances, had a very healthy diet, but provide his providers, multiples of them made assumptions about his lifestyle. And all they had to do was ask. When we look at something like sickle cell disease, black patients will show up in the emergency department in a pain crisis and are first met with the assumption that they are seeking opioids rather than they are truly in pain. And there was a study done three years ago um, that you know, is shocking in some sense that indicates that medical students and about 30% of physicians believe somehow that black men have, black and Hispanic men have thicker skin and don't feel pain as much as white men. And when we look at the sort of the research landscape, um, cystic fibrosis, rare disease, sickle cell, rare disease. Cystic fibrosis has 30,000 patients, sickle cell, 100,000 patients in the US. Sickle, cystic fibrosis has seven times the research funding of sickle cell. So we really do need to look at, you know, not only disparities in health, health, access to health and health outcomes, but we need to look at disparities in funding as well. And often we talk about the pipeline and the research pipeline. Well, it hasn't changed much. The percentage of black and Hispanic physicians is about 5% now, and it's been that way for more than 40 years. And the, the percentage of those who have R01 grants from NIH is still less than 2%. And that's been the case since the 80s. So we formed the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition. I said a bit out of you know, complaints. Um, for years, I'd been trying to get big pharmaceutical companies to come together to talk about 
participation of patients of color and their families in clinical research. And I could not get any, any takers. No one would, would wa wanted to have that conversation. And it was you know, really sort of frustrating for me. And I'd ask and I'd, I'd get a variety of excuses or reasons. But once, one time I, I did get um, sort of an honest answer. And one representative said to me, well, we don't really, we don't want to do this because we don't want to have to deal with questions around Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks or J. Marion Sims or any of the numerous historical and not so historical medical abuses. So I, I, I understood that, you know, there was this fear of having an uncomfortable conversation. And one day, not too, too long ago, I was, um, this was a few years ago, having a conversation with uh, a representative from a pharmaceutical company talking about their cervical cancer drug. And they, they wanted me to provide um, participants for their clinical trial. And I used to get calls often from pharmaceutical companies wanted, wanting the Black Women's Health Imperative to provide participants. And my answer was always no. I always said, you know, I don't run a talent agency for your clinical trial, but happy to talk about why you're calling me. So this woman and I were having a conversation about why I was not providing patients for her for their cervical cancer clinical trial. As it happened, it was the day of the opening of the movie on Henrietta Lacks. And I was sitting in a hotel lobby about to go into this meeting where I was on a panel for this, where we we're having a screening and then we we're having a talk back about Henrietta Lacks and cervical cancer. So I said to her, do you know, do you know what today is? Do you know what's happening today? And, and she said, no, what? I said, well, this is in fact the opening of the movie on, on Henrietta Lacks. And she said to me, who is Henrietta Lacks? So here is a person involved in cervical cancer clinical trials talking to me about getting black women to participate in her clinical trials. And yet she didn't know who Henrietta Lacks was. Hence, you know, my frustration, but the opportunity to actually form a coalition of researchers and patient advocates and policymakers and clinicians who were really interested in diversity in clinical trials, but also not afraid to have the uncomfortable conversation. So last year um, in May with our founding partner, Trevere, we formed the Rare Disease Diversity Coalition and it's the first of its kind. We've got more than 30 organizations um, across the industry, faith-based communities, community-based organizations, public health, all focused on rare disease, but shortening that journey from appearance of symptoms to diagnosis, to effective treatment, and to make sure that more researchers of color are included in research and trials and more patients of color. So if we can reduce the structural barriers to access to research and build awareness of the importance of clinical trial participation, particularly among patients of color and low income patients, we can attract more researchers of color and of course, more funding to focus on those rare diseases that disproportionately impact communities of color, then we can make real progress. So ultimately, we, we want to, as I said, shorten the journey, but also set the example for all of the biomedical, biotech, and medtech industry for research and policy. So just a little bit about how, how we're organized. Um, the RDDC has, is comprised of a steering committee, which is leaders from you know, across the, the partners, industry, nonprofit groups, patient advocacy, policy as well, industry alliance leaders, and the Industry Alliance Group is comprised of, of the lead funders um, for the RDDC and other pharmaceutical and biotech companies. And then there are five work groups, um, and I'll touch on those in a moment. And the work groups are really um, where the work is done. But you can see on the slide that we've got a, a number of a wide variety of participants. And it's important to know that we're focused on communities of color, low income communities. So this is everyone. It's not just black people. You know, we're the black women's health imperative, but our programs actually serve everybody. And we want to make sure everyone is included when it comes to clinical research, not only as a participant, but as a researcher. 
And this slide just shows you know, some of the of the partners, um, the, the initial partners. This endeavor over the next two to three years from both direct and indirect investment will be about $20 million. So not only is this the first of its kind, it is huge. And it's not easy for a company to pledge support to a new sort of organization or entity or effort. You know, people want to see things proven before they really invest. But these folks dug in with us and they, they supported us. They supported the idea. And there's, you know, early on, so much of the work is focused on just getting set up and crossing T's and dotting I's, but they hung in with us through dozens of conversations on objectives and structure and just the day-to-day -day work. You know, I just want to point out how unusual that is to get, to get this many groups to hang in um, through sort of the early, you know, pain producing parts of getting coalitions established and up and running. So there are five working groups as a part of the RDDC. We're focused on the patient and caregiver, provider education and engagement. We're focused on delays in diagnosis and treatment, you know, shortening that, that journey, research and clinical trials, and then of course, policy. So over the next few slides, I'm just gonna show at a very high level kind of what these groups are focused on. So one thing I'll, I'll say is that this coalition has definitely put its money where its collective mouths are. Um, in delays in diagnosis, we're focused on family health history and understanding our family history, genetic testing, and making sure that communities of color and low income communities and patients are offered genetic testing, and also getting commitment from the broader industry by through a sign on pledge to look at the work we're doing and and figure out how to deploy um, inclusive um, strategies for their patients and caregivers. On the research and clinical trials group, that's the group that I'm a co-chair of. We're absolutely focused on looking at the patient database, um, looking at the race and ethnic composition of patients in the rare in, in rare disease clinical trials, and those, you know, hopefully we'll get to claims data, look at that data and understand kind of the lay of the land for communities of color when it comes to rare disease. We're focused on getting increasing the number of, of PIs through training grants, an R25 grant, to bring in young investigators to focus on rare disease. And one of our partners, Bear Genes, actually has an app that provides um, educational videos for patients so they can learn more about uh, clinical trials and research. The Black Women's Health Imperative um, has gotten a PCORI grant and we're um, partnered with the Friends of Cancer Research and Stand Up to Cancer for an, a tool to help build awareness for Black women who want to participate in clinical trials so they'll understand what to expect, what the protocols are, you know, how things are organized, but most importantly, how to recognize when they're not getting respectful treatment and what to do um, in those cases. So over the past six months, each of these work groups has put together a list of strategic priorities, and we were able to invite the working groups to submit grant proposals to implement their, you know, their high-level objectives. And last week, we announced that each work group is going to get $100,000 to get started on this work. We know $100,000 will not solve these issues, but at least it gets them started. And it's, it's really unprecedented because normally it'll take three to five years to even get to the point where grants can be considered, um, let alone funded. There's the, there's the policy work group, obviously focused on advocacy and working um, with legislators. Um, we'll actually be doing a virtual day on the Hill where we're gonna have um, over 200 office visits um, with, with members of Congress. And we will track the regulatory comments and offer comments on behalf of the RDDC um, where appropriate. And we do actually do work with ICER now and looking at the value and valuation of drugs. In the provider education group, um, cultural training, cultural sensitivity and awareness training is critical, but we wanna develop training that gets continuing med medical education accreditation. But again, we're changing it 
not to do sort of this cultural awareness purely because you, you really can't know all cultures, but we're coming at it from a perspective of fairness and helping providers understand what fair treatment, fair communication looks like for their patients. We'll create a webinar series to hopefully um, entice more medical students into wanting to specialize in rare disease and obviously look at the pipeline and try to figure out ways to offer incentives to get more people of color to enroll in medical schools and the broader health professions in general. And we wanna create a, a Communities of Color Rare Disease Fellowship Program. So we've got three fellows who are gonna start in December who will look at rare disease and, and, and contribute to the research. And the last work group is around patients and caregivers. And this one is, is really critical. Um, we, we're, this will be data analysis so that we can under, better understand the needs of patients and their caregivers, um, understand what access looks like and what they need and how to engage them, and then actually conduct an analysis of what's happening around the country to engage patient organizations in rare disease and improve our communication and outreach to both the patients and their, their family members. So, so far in the past 16 months, we've had six steering committee meetings, four full coalition meetings, and three industry alliance meetings. And that's on top of the dozens of other work group meetings and other kinds of meetings to try to get this going. So I point this out just to say that there is real work going on. People are really busy and they've, they've hung in with us. One of our first products was the RDDC Action Plan. I encourage you all to go to the website, um, rarediseasediversity.org and download it. And it's literally a, a roadmap of our recommendations, the priorities, goals and objectives for the RDDC and what we want to see happen with diversity in rare disease. And like you know, any good organization um, and good initiative, you know, media is really important. So leading up to the launch of the RDDC, we had a webinar uh, on sickle cell, which featured renowned sports journalist, Jamel Hill, um, a nationally recognized hematologist, and five current and former NFL players who either um, had the sickle cell trait or were living or actually played with sickle cell. And it was really a huge success and our social media metrics indicated that not only did we increase awareness of the importance of clinical trials among black women, but also intent to participate and learn more. So the actual launch took place earlier this year where we, you know, we had some superstars. Um, we had Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, who is the, the head of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, Congressman GK Butterfield, uh, Leslie Foster is a well-known media personality, and again, another athlete, Alonzo Mourning, who's been living with, with kidney de disease. And so we talked about what the coalition was about, how people could get involved, and what our work plan was um, will be for the next two to three years. So it was a great way to launch um, this coalition. And as a part of that, we've got fact sheets so people can understand you know, what rare diseases are, what clinical trials participation is, what they can do. And on the website, we have stories and videos from patients to talk about kind of what living with rare disease means for them, what their journey has been like, so that, you know, particularly researchers, providers, and policymakers can learn about what the, the real journey is, what reality is, and for others to, to you know, frankly, be inspired by the the courage of many of these patients and their families. And again, like any good initiative, um, on Rare Disease Day in February, we took over Times Square and had the, the Times Square big billboard um, announcing this coalition. And that generated a fair amount of, of press. Um, even though it's the middle of COVID-19, there weren't a lot of people in Times Square, but it was good to, to see you know, rare diseases and, and diversity in rare disease being highlighted in such a significant way. And on our website, we will 
collect the stories and resources and toolkits and all of the content that we develop will be on the website. So, you know, please um, visit it um, often because we're going to keep it updated. And we're also producing materials for specific groups. So we've got materials aimed at the Black community, the Latino community, um, uh, obviously the Asian Pacific Islander community, the indigenous population, because there are diseases that are affect those community, communities differently. And we want to make sure that, that we are inclusive, of course, um, by nature of the, the work, but that they all see themselves in this work and see that that there's a group of people that have, that's really working hard on their behalf and that they're included in this effort. And this slide um, just shows much of the social media tags and content that we will keep producing um, and keep rolling out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, where I don't actually speak all of these different languages of social media, but our, our team is making sure that we use every available channel to talk to people where they are in a language, in a medium that makes sense for them. And so I'll just add one sort of final word um, to, to this work. Um, coalition building is not for the faint of heart. It's intense, it takes dedication. And honestly, no one's gonna want the coalition to work more than you will if you're starting a coalition. But I'm lucky, there are a lot of people on my team who work with our partners and the, the members of the RDDC understand how important diversity and inclusion are to research and medicine and public health. And as I said, as I said they've hung in with us. And we see that now with COVID-19 and all of the work, the, the messaging that has come out of what happened, what didn't happen, vaccine hesitancy, concerns about trials. And frankly, the vaccine trials were fairly representative. So I hope that you take from this um, that a successful nonprofit industry coalition is absolutely possible. It can be very productive and it can lead to real change. You've just got to be willing to put the work in, <laughs> have take the long view and be clear and realistic about expectations. And I would say most of all, have patience. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Great overview. Um, we have, it is 1.33, so we have, we have uh, 12 or 15 or so minutes for some questions. Um, one of the first ones I have is, put, the work that you're doing is focused on the U.S., which is kind of your market. Yep. Many of our fellows on this call and in this program are from other countries, other continents. Are there similar issues in, um, in trust of the medical system, in uh, composition of clinical trials, you know, on, demogra uh, on demographic issues that are, at, that are at play in other countries? I mean, have the lessons you've learned here, can those be transplanted to other nations and continents? Yeah, there, there, are, there are similarities. Um, we in the U.S. talk about racism and the role of racism in health outcomes and um, obviously participating in clinical research and understanding what gets research. Outside the U.S., we use the term colonialism. It has the same uh, effect. And I've done some work on the continent, and you know there isn't the kind of inclusion in clinical trials in countries in Africa that you might think, um, because again, it, it kind of boils down to money and resources and access. So I think the work of the RDDC certainly can be transferable. I mean. All, most of the, the pharmaceutical companies that are part of the RDDC actually ha are global. I mean, they have offices and do work in other countries. So there's no reason why a similar kind of coalition can't exist in other countries. And, you know, COVID-19 aside and how that's affecting tran you know, transportation, these issues remain the same. And so we've got to address colonialism and its impact on health outcomes outside the US, just like we're trying to do here, is I would imagine if I, if I could go to Tanae Lewis or Arlene Geronimus, they would see some of the same kinds of effects on health and health outcomes outside of this country um, in countries that were historically colonized um, that we see in this country. 
Okay. And just for our overseas fellows again, um, which I think is a majority of them, could you just give the the 30 second description of the of Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee experiment and the third example that you had there? I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting that. I'm just I just don't want to since you talked about Henrietta Lacks so much, I don't want to assume that the overseas fellows have the same. Yeah. Base of sure. Knowledge. So in, in the 50s, there was a, a, a black woman named Henrietta Lacks who, who had cervical cancer. And she, it was a really aggressive form of cervical cancers. She was a patient at Johns Hopkins um, University in Baltimore. And the researchers took cells, took those cervical cancer cells and, and grew them. Um, Henrietta Lacks died, I and mean, she had she had the treatment of the day, which was you know fairly harsh of radium and and what you know the kind the way we treated cancer in the fifties and the sixties. But the thing that's important about her is they created a cell line; they could grow her cells, which uh, they had failed to do previously. Henrietta Lacks's cells grew; they were they were named HeLa for Henrietta Lacks, and Johns Hopkins researchers and then others used them for for many, many therapeutic developments. And the issue is she was never asked if they could use her cells, nor was she ever given credit for those for that cell line. And that cell line is still in use today. Um, and so members of her family were never compensated. You know, that's an issue for discussion. You know, it's not clear that they were entitled to be comp compensated. But they made Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks's cells made a huge contribution to science, and so it is perceived in the black community as, at at best, disrespectful, and at worst, um, manipulation um, and uh, you know abuse of of this woman's cells. J. Marion Sims was a gynecologist who performed a number of you know thousands of surgeries, gynecologic surgeries on enslaved women at the time with no anesthesia, you know, and it's, there was probably limited anesthesia during this time anyway, but he brutalized these women to contribute to science. Um, so yes, a lot of what we know about gynecologic anatomy and other things came from his work, but he, he could do his work because he had women who, in his opinion, were disposable. And the Tuskegee Tri syphilis trial um, was actually um, occurred as a part of the, the U.S. Public Health Service, where in Tuskegee, Alabama, a, a rural part of Alabama, Black men who had syphilis were not treated. And researchers, researchers watched to see what, was, what would happen with, in these men as the disease progressed. And the reason it, it is so horrifying is because we had a treatment at the time. The treatment was withheld from these men so that these, these researchers could see what the progression of syphilis was. But of course, in doing so, syphilis was then spread to their wives and other people in the community. So they contributed to the spread of a, a highly treatable disease. Okay, and I um, mean, Tuskegee has been, been in the public consciousness for a while. The Henry and Lack story is, somewhat new. I mean, it's been focus of a book and a movie in the last decade. So if you want to check that out. Yeah. So we have some um, uh, some questions from the fellows here. Aaron Pratter from the Gazette in Colorado Springs. How do we most effectively eliminate bias amongst healthcare providers? Or is there not that much that can be done to eliminate unconscious bias and the fo focus should be on increasing diversity? Mm -hmm. Well, I, the focus, a focus should be on increasing diversity because that will help. But to be honest, there is, there's actually no way, practical way to increase the pipeline to make it as diverse as we might like, because there just isn't the capacity. If a you know, billion dollars fell out of the sky to, to fund scholarships into medical school, there's, there's not enough medical schools, there's not enough hospitals, there's not enough faculty. You couldn't actually put another 30,000 providers of color into the system. And so what we have to focus on is understanding how to treat patients, understanding their lived experience. And that's why we're focused with RDC, not so much on sort of training, the typical diversity training, but talking about fairness. Everybody knows what fair feels like, whether you're a physician, a nurse, a patient. And so we're starting with, you know, okay, provider X, 
would you offer the same, these same sets of recommendations, same treatment if this patient were your mother or your sister or your grandmother? Because people can comprehend, yes, I would treat the person I love most this way. And if we could get to that point, you know, then, then we can really close the gap because people, conversations would take place that are simply not taking place now. Questions would be asked that aren't being asked now. And providers would not be making the assumptions. But we also have to look at what happens in medical school because much of the diagnostic journey is based on research that only included white patients. So if you're looking at a patient and you, know, you read in the literature, you know, look for flush. Well, if I've got really, really dark skin, you're not going to see the flush. So you may just objectively miss something. So we really have to be very comprehensive about not only how we interact, but how we consider and what we consider to be evidence for decision making. Okay. So now we have a question from um, Ridwan Kareem Dini Osman, a fellow from GH1 TV in Ghana. Distrust for, med distrust for foreign medicine is such a big problem in Ghana. I did a documentary on vaccine hesitancy and some of the views were shocking, especially experiments like the Tuskegee one done um, at, by a doctor named Sims. With your wealth of experience, how do you reckon medical structures can rebuild trust and restore public confidence in Africa? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, part of what I would like to see, and I don't, this may not be in a, a very satisfactory answer. Um, you know, we've got a lot of cross fertilization. A lot of uh, young physicians come to, from, from the continent, come to the U.S. to be trained or further trained. What we don't see enough of are physicians, particularly black physicians, leaving the U.S. and going to countries in Africa to do that cross training. Um, I want to believe that if we could foster that, patients on the continent could see and hear and be treated by other providers in you know, partnership with, um, you know, with, their, with their, their, their countrymen and women, that might help reduce some of the suspicion, because a lot of this depends on where you're getting your information from. And that's why we see a lot of the bias among foreign um, providers outside the U.S. once they come to the U.S., because they're, they're, the media they consume portrays black patients, brown patients, a certain way. So if we can sort of change that and change the way people are perceived, I think that we can help make some progress. But clearly, we've got to look at pipeline issues and we've got to build the clinical research infrastructure outside of this country. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I have one here, another one from Aaron, Aaron Prater from Colorado. Can you speak a bit to the double whammy of minority status and disability on the socioeconomic status of people of color in the U.S. and elsewhere? Yeah. Well, Aaron, I think you just said it. It is truly a double whammy. I mean, if you're a person of color, you, you know, you, you already experience a number of disparities, but then if you are a person of color with ability issues, it's even worse. You're much less likely to be employed. You're much, much less likely even to go on to higher education. So in this country, as well as others, we really have to, to reframe our thinking around ableism. And there are people trying to do that. And I'm hoping with this current legislation around the CARES Act and, um, this next bill that's going to go forward will have more money put into ensuring true inclusion and not just inclusion along kind of race and ethnicity lines. Okay, and one more question from Aaron. I think this will be the last one for this session. Um, also on the issue of bias among healthcare providers, would efforts to boost health literacy among individuals of color and low-income individuals help eliminate bias among healthcare providers? Yeah, I don't, I, it, it wouldn't hurt, but I honestly don't think health literacy is the issue. We, we can't put solving the bias issue on the shoulders and backs of the people who are underserved, who are disadvantaged. It's not their responsibility or their role to fix it. Um, we can't make them physicians. We can't make them nurses. We can't make them know what questions to ask. What we can do is work with providers to treat patients all patients with respect and dignity. So I'm always very careful not to make this the, the problem of people of color to solve. This is a problem of our systems and our science to solve. 
OK, and with that, I think we need to draw this uh, session to a close. Uh, Linda Golo Blunt, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, I, and fellows, she is going to be back at 3 o'clock Eastern for one of the breakout sessions. So if you have additional questions for her, that will be the small group session so you can get a, a good uh, small group discussion going. Thank you.